Okay, can you hear me? Does this work? Yes. Um, hello, my name is Jan George from Internet Society. I come from Slovenia. Who here knows where Slovenia is? Roughly. Okay, good. It's in Europe. Huh? Second mic. Okay, there we go. High availability, they call it. <laughs> Right, so um, I'm from Internet Society um, and I would like to talk about some real life experience with uh, NET64. Um, let's see if I can move forward. Ah, okay. So, first, about um, to introduce myself briefly. Before joining Internet Society, I was the CEO of Go6 Institute, the not for profit organization in Slovenia for deployment of IPv6. Uh, I've been dealing with IPv6 for over for 20 years now. So whatever I do, um, I build in IPv6. And then at the end, when everything works, I add IPv4 and hope that everything works. So I have more, more experience in IPv6 than in IPv4, basically. Um, and basically, um, we put together a lab uh, to test IPv6 um, mechanisms, protocols, uh, to test the software, the hardware, the solutions. And now, when I joined ISOC, I had this privilege to travel around the world and talk to operators all around the world and internet communities and help them with deployment of IPv6. So, who in this room is currently deploying IPv6 in their network? Hands up. Okay. Not many, but you, you, you probably understand that you will have to, right? Um, sooner or later, because IPv4 is over. Um, and maybe this, this is a quite advanced uh, a topic, but you will bump into these problems that I will describe here sooner or later. Hopefully sooner than, than later. All right. So, okay. What is the problem statement? Let me, let me walk you through all the six degrees of my inner turbulence. Um, IPv4 and IPv6 are incompatible on the wire level, right? They are ships in the night. They don't talk to each other. There are two different protocols, like IPX and LAT, or TechNet, or, or whatever you can run on, on, on the network. So we need transition and translation mechanisms between the two protocols. Why? Um, IPv6 was designed and built with this premise in mind that it will be implemented in the last 20 years and widely used and that IPv4 will just slowly fade away and we will not need to translate between these two protocols. That's why it was designed not to be compatible with IPv4 because it fixes many, many things that are not entirely optimal in IPv4. But this didn't happen. We are late with IPv6 deployment, so we need to do some translation. So m mobile operators are massively switching to IPv6 only. For example, T-Mobile USA, as we speak currently, has over 52 million mobile devices Android mobile devices that are on IPv6 only. So these 52 million devices needs to go through translation through a NET64 mechanism to reach the IPv4 content wherever in the world it is. Um, and of course they're using 464 XLAT on the device itself that is built in the Android and enabled by default to basically mask some problems with the, with the translation. And this is quite efficient stuff. Um, of course, when people is enabling IPv6, they do weird stuff. Some people just are struggling with understanding of how to use IPv6. And while you are in the learning curve, you do, you do weird things sometimes. You think you are doing the, the right thing. You think you are doing the good thing. And you don't even realize you did a mistake. So people does weird things. And 
at the end of the world, at, at the end of the day, um, while I was traveling around the world and talked to, to all these content providers that are enabling IPv6 and uh, um, uh, service providers enabling IPv6, I heard similar questions from, 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 from service providers, from ISPs. I heard, how will my users see the content on the web, on, on the internet, if I enable IPv6 only and send them through the translation, basically T-Mobile and other big mobile operators. And then you see, you see content providers saying, how will my content be seen from these environments that are IPv6 only? Um, what will be the user experience? So we said, well, we need to test it, right? And we built the tool that I will talk about later. Um, so let's get this out of the way first. Uh, acknowledgements, uh, credits, supporters. Um, th there was massive amount of work put into this testing and setting up the whole environment and also Net64 check tool. So I would like to thank Internet Society to dedicate lots of my work time into these experiments and into doing this stuff in, in, in my lab back in Slovenia and, and also to support all my endeavors on IPv6. Uh, of course, Go6 Institute Slovenia to, to, to give um, uh, to funding and running the Go6 lab where we got connectivity, hardware, software and things like this. You will see my little lab uh, later. Um, Sander Stefan and his company to put all the effort in the in the programming and coding and thinking about this tool, uh, I did I do lots of stuff with with Sander. We wrote several uh, uh, RIPE documents, best compilation practices together, and of course, when it came to build the tool, um, I started this idea with some scripting. I'm I'm not a programmer. I'm a I'm a I'm a network engineer and and, and Unix engineer. I'm not a programmer. So when I, when I started building this tool with some scripts and Sander saw my, what the code that I did, if I can call it a code, he said, sir, step back from the keyboard and delete this, I will do it. So <laughs> he took out Python and Django and, and just started building the tool. And of course, Kareem Pritchard, uh, girlfriend, Sander's girlfriend, for lovely the tool design and uh, front end and all the hacks to, to Kareem. Alright, let's, first things first, um, what is NET64 um, and how, how, how it works? Um, it basically, you need DNS64, um, uh, DNS server, that's, that is actually modified DNS server, and if that server does not get the quad A record for IPv6, um, um, that is, that's the, the, instead of A record, it's quad A record, and that indicates that this site has IPv6. Um, it's, connect, it's connectable over IPv6, it's present on IPv6, and there is IPv6 address afterwards. If there is no quad A, then it synthesizes the quad A record with the NAT64 prefix plus IPv6, IPv4 address in hex, and, and gives you a long IPv6 address and redirect this traffic to, to, to the NET64 mechanism. It's, it's quite complex, you, you better look it up if you don't understand how it works. But what we wanted to do is to set up the public test bed in our lab that has this NET64 prefix, uh, not the private one, but globally uh, reachable one. So we used um, NET64 prefixes for all four uh, versions of NET64 test beds in our lab uh, from the global uh, unicast pool. That means that if you connect from here, you have IPv6 here. If you you can you can test how all four versions of NET64 uh, translation works. From here, you just you just set the, 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 the DNS resolver to the right one. I will I will show you later the instructions, and you can start sending IPv6 packets up to Slovenia, where they will be translated, and you can you can actually test how how this service works, 
and if your services are working over Net64 or how your users will, will, will experience um, uh, the IPv4 content uh, in IPv6 only environment. Um, this is used by operators, this is used by software vendors, uh, it's free, it's completely free. Well, everything I will be talking here about, it's completely free. It's for the community, it's for you, it's made for you. Um, for example, when, when Android guys, uh, Lorenzo Caliti and uh, Eric Klein, when they were building the 464 XLAT uh, part of Android phone, they actually tested it from Japan towards my, uh, our Slovenian Go6 lab, and I, I, I received an, a, an email from them saying, Jan, thank you for running four different versions of Net64, because we tested remotely and we found a little weirdness with one of implementations and we found the bug and fixed the bug so now everything works. So this is, this is quite useful stuff. Uh, and then it gains some tra traction and momentum these days so there is quite a lot of traffic coming, coming through these uh, translation uh, test beds uh, that are online. Here is, the, here is the URL of the instructions, how to use it remotely. It's very easy. You just switch off IPv4 and you just set the, the DNS resolver to the one that is here, so here is the, the, the screenshot of the, of the uh, instructions. Um, and here you see we have A10 networks implementation. And then you set, does this work? If you set your, your recursive DNS to this one, everything automatically starts to work. Don't forget to turn off your IPv4. I know it's scary, but it, 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 it will work, I, believe me. Then we have Palo Alto Networks Firewall. Uh, that has Net64 functionality. If you set this DNS to, to, to this number, then you will start sending packets to this machine. YOL is uh, it's an, an open source, free uh, module for, for Linux. You can build it and run it. Um, I don't know if there is Net64 for, for free BSD. I will, I will check it out. Is there? Okay, you will help me say that. Okay. And then we have Cisco AirSer 1000. Cisco just sent me a, a, an AirSer 1K box to, to sit in my lab and then and, and just perform the Net64 function. So these are four test beds. If you want to, to test how things are working, they are open for you. All right, this is, this is the hardware. So this is my little lab. Um, it's quite a, a bunch of uh, hardware. Uh, these are the, 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 the Palo Alto firewalls, uh, the ASR1K and things like this. So this is, this is the real thing. It's not something virtual in the cloud. This is the real thing. It, it's, it's noisy, it's, it consumes lots of power, but it works fine. All right. Yeah, so uh, uh, Sander likes to, to, to call it systematic chaos, and it is a systematic chaos. All right. So, after setting these Net64 test beds, um, from time to time I look into log files and then I see from the DNS64 server and from Net64 server that sometimes things are going wrong. And then I got curious because people said, oh, with Net64 and 464 XLED everything works. Yes, but... And then I started looking into, into the real life scenarios when things start going wrong. And I figure out that there are several cases when things go wrong. Nothing wrong with the technology. The problem usually sits between the chair and the keyboard, as usual. So, we have seen people putting the quad A record in DNS with the value of column column. That is not going very far. If you try to send people to a quad A record with IPv6 address of column column, that is not going anywhere, believe me. Really, it's not going anywhere. Column column one, the local host. So you may be seeing your local uh, version of, of website and you, you can declare that it works but nobody else in the world can see your website with this as column column. Then we have column column FFF column IPv4 address. 
not going to work. FV80, this is linked local. Seriously? People put this in a, in a public DNS record. <coughs> then we have 64FF9B, that's a well known prefix for NAT64. Then we have 2001DB8, that's a documentation prefix. Don't copy paste without changing it from the internet. So if you put any of this in your quad A record into the, into the DNS, the DNS 64 that is on the other side will actually receive the quad A record and will not synthesize the, 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 the NET64 quad A record and it will not send things to the translator. And if the other end is on IPv6 only, and this is the only thing it got to connect, it will just fail. It will not connect, it will not work. These people will not see your website at all. Um, so Dan Wink, he used to work for Cisco. He is doing the um, Quad A stats and he is collecting a big uh, amount of uh, data. And here you can see basically uh, what kind of stupid things people, people do. Um, then we have confusion with www or without www. For example, firstinside.com, if we have um, uh, with www, um, we have just IPv4 address. And if we try firstinside.com without www, has IPv6 address of colon colon. Very nice. Colon colon is the whole IPv6 internet. This will not work, especially not in IPv6 only environment. Then we have um, also other things, but there are things that, that, that people do on the internet. So how can we fix them? If we are a service provider, we would like our users to have a good user experience, not to call our help desk and go, oh, internet doesn't work, or I cannot connect to site X, or I don't know, um, you have broken network or something like this. So if we are, if we are um, a network provider, then we need to somehow mitigate these things. First, if you are, if you are not part of a solution, you are part of a problem. You need to always understand that. In my 20 years of, of being in this business, you are part of a problem, if not part of a solution. So, um, I figured out, because people started complaining that NET64 doesn't work for some, for some cases, that, okay, IANA allocated 2000 column column slash 3 as a global unicast address pool. And whatever is in quad A record that is outside this global unicast pool is most probably wrong. So, but now comes the, the sort of like a moral question. Should we leave these people offline for IPv6 only users and send them an email and hope that the email re uh, they receive an email over IPv6 that they got the configuration wrong or should we mask their problems? So let's see how we can mask their problems. For example, bind, bind9 example, bind9 has the DNS64 um, um, uh, module. And what, what did I do? I just said exclude whatever is in zero, column, column, slash three, that's the first part. Then it's 200 slash three, and then it's 400800 and 2001 DB8, that's a documentation prefix. So this is, this is the important one. If you, so it says, you as a DNS64 server, if you receive a quad A that is inside any of this, that means outside of the global unicast, just discard it and create the quad A record that has NAT64 prefix plus IPv4 address as in hex and everything will just automatically start working. Um, so, OK, 
Okay, there is a little bit of moment of betrayal. DNSSEC, let's talk about DNSSEC and NAT64 and DNS64. As you probably know, the DNSSEC is the mechanism how you sign your zone. And you have a private key and you sign the zone and you publish the, the, the research records and all sort of crypto stuff. I have 10 minutes. Oh boy, I'm not even at, in half a presentation. All right, I will start going very fast now. Okay, uh, DNSSEC, if you sign your zone with DNSSEC, and if, if the DNS64 needs to um, make the Quad A records artificially for you, there is no way the DNS64 server can sign this record. Because if, if, if I am making the Quad A record for some, some your content provider and they signed it with DNSSEC, I don't have the private key. That means DNS64 breaks DNSSEC. Therefore, you need to put in the break DNSSEC yes configuration directive. Uh, it's a little bit of moment of betrayal because we love DNSSEC and we encourage DNSSEC. But if you go to IPv6, no, if you, if you sign your zone with DNSSEC and you don't go to IPv6, then somebody will start um, uh, somebody will, will start producing and making quad A records for you and not sign them, so you are in trouble. If you do IPv, if you do DNSSEC, go to IPv6 and create quad A records for yourself. Okay? So, this is if you, if you ask for, for quad A for 4.gosix.si, um, this DNS server and without break DNSSEC, yes, you just don't get a response because there is there is no valid response if you if you try to validate. If you if you put in the break DNS sec yes directive, then you get the response that's a NAT64 globally reachable uh, prefix, and this is the IPv4 address of of the of the uh, of this stuff. Okay, uh, unbound to make Philip happy. Uh, this is the, the, the same thing, uh, just a little bit different syntax. Uh, this is the configuration for unbound if you want to avoid problems with DNS64. That's how you do it. And there is more reading on DNS64 and DNSSEC uh, written by our, our friends at the ITF. Uh, if you want to understand profoundly how these two interact, there is the whole RFC that explains in depth what's going on. All right, I need to be fast now, right? Very fast, very, very fast, okay. A few examples, firewalls.com. You, you, you expect them to be very, very safe and secure. Uh, you see, here it's IPv4, no problem. NAT64, still waiting for the timeout. Indeed, it's very secure, of course. They put in quad a rep record of column, column, FFF, column, and IPv4 address. Not going to work at all. Uh, Spain, I hear that they fixed it now. Uh, this is IPv4, this is IPv6 and NET64. You get something completely different. Uh, this is from Slovenia, Schrani.si. This is sort of like uh, to, to put files on, uh, on uh, online storage. And it says that um, um, this is the geolocation, basically, and, and it says, oh, you are, you are not from Slovenia, you cannot store files here. I said, no, I'm sitting in my lab inside Slovenia, what's wrong with you? Because they didn't implement geolocation as they did for IPv4 um, um, on, their, on their product. So even this is something to consider. Then we have uce.cn, this is the IPv4 version of it, and this is NAT64 version of it, something completely confused. Um, for example, people from Germany, this is, uh, this is a store, eBay something. Here on IPv4 and NAT64, people can see uh, what you are selling. If you're on IPv6 only, and people can see a store like this, people will not buy stuff. People will just not buy stuff from you, if, if you do it like this. Then we have the Gateway Pundit, you see this is the failure. Uh, then we have if you have non-working quad-a record, it's broken NAT64 because um, 
they put in the right quad A record and uh, you can see that uh, the server even returned the pings but there is no web server that is listening on this IPv6 address so people will not be able to connect at all because even NAT64 would not work because it has quad A record and it will not synthesize the translation quad A record so you see people is doing many 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 crazy things around the world um, you see here if you um, in this tool that I will present about later if I have time um, you will see here for example the, uh, if, if you want to go into depth of what is going on in this tool you press this a uh, little triangle here with the resources match and it will open for you all the um, elements that loaded from that page over NET64, IPv4 only and IPv6 only. So here you can see the difference and all the elements that are there. Okay, so how to test all these things? So we are seeing them because you know in, in our region IPv6 deployment is on ramping we have lots of IPv6 traffic uh, Google is receiving 20% of the traffic to their all their services is now over IPv6 so that's a huge number people is implementing IPv6 Facebook is on IPv6 lots of people is using it but we need to detect all these troubles so we built a tool that's called net 6 4 check and you have here the URL. You can test it if, if you like. It's open. It's net64check.go6lab.si. It's open. It's free. What you do is you just write in here the URL of your website that you would like to test. Okay? And then press this green button. And here is the list of the, of the tests that, and measurements that have been done in, in the past. Um, then you you also have filters. You can press I don't know IPv4 or IPv6. Uh, it's poor, mediocre, or good. So it does sorting. You can search among uh, the measurements and things like this. Um, and for example, the mirror. Um, after some time, please don't press the button many times. This is quite a complex process behind. When you press the button, many things happen. I will talk about this later if I have time. Um, you will see here, for, for, for example, this is an example of the result. And if you do mouse over, uh, it will show you the difference in what the tool gets from your website. So, for example, if you do the mouse over, you see, it shows you the, it shows you the, the difference. Right? Um, I need to... I need to tell you, in this tool, we don't fix brokenness. We don't exclude all these crazy things that people do with quad A's. Uh, we even put uh, the IPv6 on a MTU restricted VLAN, and that this is emulating people on the tunnels. So if you if you did IPv6 on your web server, and if you broke the path MTU discovery, your results will be bad. Um, how does this all work? Let's uncover some, let's do the illumination theory. How does, does all this work? We have a management server and web interface. We have server with IPv4 only connectivity. We have server with IPv6 only connectivity and server with NET64. And uh, in Go6Lab, we built it in, uh, on a Proxmox. And in Sanders Lab, it's built on a, on a VMware uh, cluster. <laughs> And we're using Phantom JS. We will change this to something else and more supported in the next version of it. Um, and this keeps track of all loaded resources and makes screenshot when the page is loaded. So this thing actually uh, compare images with each other and check for the resources that that were loaded. This is how it works. Some images and words. This is master and web interface. So when you type in net 64 checkgo 6 labsi you come to this machine, that's a web interface. And when you type in the URL that you want to check, it sends the command to all these three servers, and all these three th servers go and fetch your URL, your, your content from the internet. 
This one over IPv4 only, over IPv6 only, and this one has NET64 mechanism built around. And whatever is displayed and whatever is, uh, is uh, um, uh, produced, then it compares and tells you this is how you, you are seen from all these uh, different environments. Um, please run the test and uh, check the score. Um, please take the time because you know this is quite a complex process between all these machines and there are timeouts and, and, and all this stuff that, that needs to, to be finished so the browser can render the image and all this stuff. So it will continuously tell you test in progress until everything is done. Please be patient, take your time. It will, it will not run anywhere. It, the test will be finished, but just don't be impatient. Um, if you find the issue with your web page, well, wash, rinse and repeat. Um, just figure out from the test result what is wrong, what you are what you're doing wrong, and just go and fix the problem and test again. Um, and you repeat until your website is not broken. Please remember, if you have DNS problems, DNS needs some time to propagate because there are time there are TTLs and things like this. If you fix DNS, the new result will not be immediately seen. Wait for the DNS refresh timeout and then try again. Um, for example, not properly working target domain. Uh, for example, the name qq.com has a problem with, uh, with SOA that is not in subdomain and it's invalid response. With the normal DNS, you could get away with it. With DNS 6.4, no way. These people will not be reachable. Um, the next 6.4 check code is available on GitHub. On GitHub, it's open source. We're looking for help. We're looking for developers. Uh, Sander is a very busy man, and I can't code. So we need we need four people that would 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 join the the team and volunteer to to help with uh, with. Uh, with Python and building. Now we are we are thinking of building the next version, version two, that will include the cent two central stations, and then we, we we would like to encourage people to install the instances of this tool around the world in different data centers. So so you don't check your visibility just from one vantage point, but you can check it from many, and then even compare how you are visible from different parts of the, of the world. So we're trying to build sort of like a net six for measurement system uh, around the world. But it doesn't matter. Here is the code. If you are, if you are a Python, uh, Python programmer or developer, and if you have time and will to, to, to volunteer and, and work with us on this interesting stuff, uh, we are more than happy to build the community around it. And this brings me to the last slide. Um, Conclusion, if you are a content provider, use this tool to test how your content is seen uh, to all these different IPv6 and NET64 environments. If you are a connectivity provider, test how your users will experience the internet. And if both, all of the above. And when you use the tool, if you have an idea how to improve it, how to make it better, what to add, what functionality to add, Feel free to send us an email. Uh, our emails are here, Sanders and mine. Uh, we are more than happy to, to, to get all possible ideas how to make this tool better and would be grateful if, if, you, could, if you could contribute. And with this, are there any questions? Am I, am I awfully late? Yes, fashionably awfully late, thank you. Any questions? is confused or I was very clear all right then please use the tool and thank you very much